All right, good morning. Welcome to Faith Church Adult Sunday School, Pilgrim's Progress Part 2. And uh, we're going to have some fun with uh, some ground that I have never covered before. So that's always that's always fun. I've never read Pilgrim's Progress Part Two. I've, of course, I've read for for this week and and some further into the into the book, but uh, certainly have not come to the to the end of it. And um, so we're going through this adventure together, and um, we get to um, to have a, a sense of the new and uh, the different. And um, so today I'm excited to, uh, to be doing that. It's mostly an introductory day, as you'll see. And um, let me read to us a passage of scripture from Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37, uh, beginning in chapter 37, verse 1. It's a familiar passage. Um, Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to, to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Valley of Dry Bones uh, becomes a living army of God's people. Um, so today, as we go through this um, time in Pilgrim's Progress 2, we have some teaching exec. Uh, objectives. One, to introduce the second part of Pilgrim's Progress, and two, to compare and contrast the two parts of the story. Three, to describe Christian's, uh, Christiana's decision to become a pilgrim, and four, well, four, to promote a greater uh, appreciation for the ways that God works within families. So, 
an interesting, interesting time before us today. Hear this from John Bunyan. Go then, I say, tell all men who thou art. Say, I am Christiana, and my part is now with my four sons to tell you what it is for men to take a pilgrim's lot. So let's uh, pray, and then we will shift over to the uh, video. Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for this time that we can share together and, and enjoy a study in this great book that points us to the greater book in the Bible. And uh, we see so much of uh, your word uh, in Bunyan's work, and we thank you for it. And, and Lord, we pray that as we uh, follow this story, that um, we will see ourselves in it, and we will see those around us in it, and um, that it will grow us in grace. All for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's cut to the, uh, to the video. copy in some form. Uh, I was remiss in um, talking about um, where you can find um, Pilgrim's Progress Part 2. Um, and if you, if you, hopefully you saw the email that I sent out uh, this week that talks about uh, different links. I gave you some links uh, to an audio book where you can listen to it uh, being read, or um, there are options that you can get a hold of. We have one, I know we have one copy left on our book table of this uh, book. Uh, it's Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress by Penguin Classics. Uh, it has both part one and part two in it, quite good. Um, Jim Stevens uh, shared a link yesterday on Slack uh, if you have not seen that or are not on Slack, um, maybe we can, we can probably share that to you on, um, on email. In fact, Jim can probably take care of that um, even today um, and send out a, a church-wide email with that uh, connection, that link uh, to a PDF version, which is it's quite well done. It has some nice notes with it. And uh, so I commend that to you as well. If you, if you haven't already found uh, a copy to read and are, are not reading, uh, please don't be discouraged. You can catch up easily. Uh, it is, it is you know, it's not easy reading. You gotta pay attention because you know, of course the language is that of the late 17th century. Um, but it's, it's not so difficult that you can't understand what's going on. And, um, so with that uh, encouragement to uh, get the resources and read them or, or listen to them, um, let's uh, start with our discussion questions. Also, um, just by, by way of reminder, um, if you have a question or if you have a comment or something you'd like to share with the group, uh, please do so through our uh, chat uh, mode in Zoom. And I've got, Tim Snyder here with me, uh, who's running, helping run the chat, and he can feed uh, questions to me. So with that, let's look at number one of our discussion questions. Uh, what are some of the reasons that few people have read the second part of Pilgrim's Progress? Based on the overview given in this message, what are some of the major differences between part one of Pilgrim's Progress and part two? All right, um, if you've read so far, if you've gotten Christiana up to the wicket gate, 
uh, and oh, well, and through through the wicket gate, um, which I I hope you you have, and um, there's to all the way up to the point where she, as she and Mercy are are but the boys are taken off to go down the path uh, beyond the wicket gate. Uh, Christiana has a little song that she sings, a little bit of verse that's there. That's what we're, I wanted you to read up to today, for today. So if you've gotten that far, then you know that the first couple of pages are uh, Bunyan's apology for writing uh, his explanation for writing part two. And um, that section is, is difficult, uh, much, is more difficult than the narrative. Um, and then, uh, like Derek noted in uh, his talk, the, uh, as we get into the narrative itself, we have Bunyan, um, you know, having a chance to, to dream again and to continue the dream. And uh, in that dream, he meets Mr. Sagacity, a um, man of, of great knowledge and wisdom and able to discern. And so Sagacity tells him uh, about Christiana and uh, tells him about what's going on with as they're walking along uh, by the city of destruction. And that section is, I found it, you know, not, it's not hard to read. Um, it's not quite as engaging as, as what you start reading once you get to the, the writer's perspective uh, from Christiana herself, which is, which is much more engaging. But, here we have Mr. Sagasti playing the, the role of the narrator, and um, and that's how how we begin, uh, which is not what you find in the uh, in the first first part of the book. But um, major differences between uh, part one and part two, and I think uh, um, Thomas Derek Thomas did a great job of of pointing that out and and putting his finger on it. Is the uh, the difference between individual and um, corporate? Definitely, you have more of the corporate feel uh, with part two. Part one, you know, Christian begins by trying to persuade his family to come with him uh, and and of course they refuse and so we get his his travels and although we get to to meet some of his companions along the way particularly faithful and hopeful and get to know them a little bit um, neither of them is with him the whole way but in in part two uh, there's more of this corporate feel with Christiana and her four children, as well as Mercy. Uh, and I like the, you know, Derek's, um, when you're talking about it, has a more of a churchy feel. There's, there's more of a, more in view here of normal life, um, what we would, most of us would experience. Um, whereas, in part one, we have this kind of hero story of with Christian uh, and you know the you know running into all these big kind of conflicts and and uh, having to overcome great dangers and all that kind of thing. Um, in part two, it's a little different. It's it's. You know, it's not the the super uh, hero kind of story. Um, it's probably something that most of us are going to more readily uh, relate to. Uh, it's more pastoral in that sense, I think. Um, and so that's uh, that's helpful. 
I'm going to, for lack of a better term, right now, I'm just going to say it's more normal, <laughs> meaning more common uh, to what we uh, typically experience in the Christian walk. And those are, those are some, of the, some of the things that I see. Are there things that, that you see um, that you would like to, to add to that? Um, I'm not, Tim doesn't have anything for me yet, but uh, if you want to add something, please do so. By the way, how many people have signed up? Okay. Okay, great. So there's 14 of us. Uh, we typically have 16 to 18. Uh, hopefully, we've got somebody or two that a body or two that are out because of the of Thanksgiving. Um, but encourage people to to take part in this. And I know it's it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of work uh, on your part to stay up with the reading. Uh, so you know what's going on, um, but the reading is delightful, and I would encourage you to do it, and encourage others to do it as well. So, um, if you come up with some things that struck you, then pass them on uh, later. Um, and if you're answering a question or or asking a question about a question. Um, please note which question you're asking because I'm pressing on to question two. So how has the first part of this study impacted you? What are your expectations for the second part of our study? Uh, here's a, there's a couple of questions here. They're, you know, just very personal, very individual. I mean, what are you thinking? How are you feeling? Uh, uh, what's your response? And so, uh, if you don't send in your responses, you're going to get mine. So that's, that's the way it's going to work. Um, how's the first part of this study impacted you? Um, I, I find it intriguing um, because I have spent um, quite a bit of time, you know, not I'm by no means a Bunyan scholar at all, um, but I have worked through Pilgrim's Progress, I don't know, maybe six times, six, seven times with uh, people, uh, with small groups and um, with individuals as we've gone through Pilgrim's Progress. And, you know, I've read the story numerous times now. And um, so this is, this is new ground, as it were, as we talk about this, this first section um, of part two. And it's fresh for me. I, you know, I, I know what to expect in part one. Um, in part two, I'm not sure what to expect. And I'm finding that refreshing. And I'm also finding that uh, exciting um, because there is a different feel to it. It is more pastoral. It is, um, I, you know, I, it's interesting. I think Bunyan, you see Bunyan maturing in his, in his faith and in his, um, I shouldn't say necessarily faith, and it is, but um, maturing and in, in growing in grace, uh, growing as a pastor um, and bring with growing in his pastoral concern uh, for people. And, uh, and that's evident here. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, so as we, as we look at between here, between, you know, November 29th and uh, January 10th, when we finish this study, Lord willing, um, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I think it's a, a great, you know, it's an empty slate for me. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that we're, you know, I love Derek Thomas. He was a professor of mine. I had many classes with him. 
Um, and when he says that part two is probably a little better than part one, uh, I take him at his word and um, I'm excited about that uh, because there's so much good, so many good illustrations there, so much that we can grow from. And uh, if we put it into practice, because as you read and you'll see it, and if you've read it all, you know what I'm talking about. Bunyan writes in a, I mean, you see the, the Bible and passages from the Bible just written in phrases and, and passages that, and verses that you'll, you know, you know, just incorporate it into the narrative and you see it uh, applied in ways that are very practical, very helpful. And for me, that's exciting. And for our second part of the study, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. And um, I hope you uh, feel the same. And um, so how's the first part of this, okay, excuse me, the story of Christiana and the boys illustrates the way that God can bring spiritual life to an entire family. Even though some family members may initially show great resistance to the gospel. In this case, do you mostly identify with Christian, Christiana, or their children? Explain your answer. And this is, uh, this is uh, another kind of very personal question uh, on, you know, where, where do you fit in here? How do you respond? Um, and, you know, what's your own story? What's your own conversion story? Um, since, I, you know, I'm the teaching elder and I sit on the session as the moderator, I get the privilege, the great privilege of hearing people's testimonies. And we probably don't make as big a deal of testimonies as we probably should. Um, that's something that I, that I should probably try to figure out ways that we can um, incorporate that more into our church life. Um, because think about your testimony. What is your testimony? You know, if you don't have a testimony, then you need to be evangelized. Okay. So, uh, and your testimony doesn't have to be some, you know, amazing story of, you know, this, you know, you know, I was a drug addict or, or, you know, I was a drug dealer or, you know, I, some kind of crazy wild person who was out, out doing my own thing all the time, um, <clears throat> doing drugs or, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll and all that kind of stuff, partying. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, I got, I got converted and, you know, God changed me. And now I'm a, a godly, you know, church going person, that kind of thing. You know, if you have that kind of testimony, praise the Lord that he has brought you out of that profligate life into uh, following him. But not everybody has that kind of testimony. You know, some people, you know, they can't tell you a day or a time. They don't know. Um, they don't know a day when they didn't know that Jesus was their savior and Lord. They were raised in the church, they were raised in the faith, and um, there there came a time, probably when they when they made a profession of faith that was their own personal testimony, their own personal profession. But you know, they're just telling the church, you know, what they've always believed, uh, and that's you know the the testimony of someone who is a covenant child. And praise the Lord when that happens. And may it be for all our children uh, that they not have to go into a time of being the, 
the prodigal son who then uh, comes back and, and is converted, but that they grow up in the faith and that they always know that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and are trusting by faith in him. Um, so the reason I make a, a big point on the testimony is this. Um, a testimony is a critical part of our being able to reach out to others and share the love of Jesus and to share the gospel with them. Now we can share the we can share the gospel indeed uh, by showing the love of Jesus to people without ever saying anything about Jesus. Uh, but the gospel does not get translated that way. People don't understand the gospel truth. They just receive, you know, maybe gospel benefit from your changed life as you love them as Christ loved you. But they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the words of Jesus. They need to hear, you know, if they don't hear the preaching of the gospel, they'll never be converted. And so there's a place where we need to speak the truths of the gospel. And our testimony is a primary place where we do that. You need to have a testimony. Uh, I would tell you, listen to me very carefully here. <laughs> I would tell you that you need to have several testimonies. And what I mean by that is, no, you're not making up stories. You're telling the truth about how you were converted. And when I mean by different testimonies, I mean, you need to have the elevator testimony and the coffee table testimony. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? With the elevator testimony, how long are you on an elevator with someone? You know, not very long. You need to have a testimony that you can speak in, you know, one to two minutes. Now, <laughs> you're not going to be able to say a whole lot. But, you know, can you, can you relate in a few sentences how you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior? How do you, how he is your only hope in life and in death? Um, and so that's the elevator testimony. And you need to have this testimony that the coffee table testimony that you can speak in, you know, maybe you have the luxury of, of taking 20 to 30 minutes, you know, um, and beyond that, there's EE. <laughs> Evangelism Explosion, if you'll remember Evangelism Explosion. Evangelism Explosion trains you this way. I mean, it trains you to, to be able to do it quickly. It trains you to be able to do it in, in, a, in a long format. It takes me about 45 minutes uh, to go through the full testimony, uh, the full gospel presentation um, for EE. But, you know, you can, you can do it in, in various ways as you have opportunity, as the Lord opens those doors for you. But if you only have a short window, you need to be able to, to have that testimony. And, and don't think, okay, well, I need to have a one to two minute testimony and then leave it at that. Because if you don't have it in your mind, what, you're, what you need to say, when the time comes, you're not going to say it. Um, it's, not, it's not prepared. Now, Yes, the Holy Spirit can, will give you words to speak at the time, but how much better if, you, if the Holy Spirit offers you the opportunity and you're prepared, and then he gives you the confidence to speak um, out your testimony that way, that you have it clear and concise um, and know what you're about. Um, that's very important. So I would encourage you, if you've never done this before, it's a great exercise. It's an encouraging exercise because it, it feeds your own faith to 
work up a testimony. Um, not only a short one, but a long one as well. So you can tell people in, in clear and concise ways that are sensible um, how you were converted, what your life was like and how, what your life is like now that you know Jesus, what your life was like before you knew Jesus. Um, and so we'll leave that there. I have a, something from Tim here. You shared uh, a few little stories on, uh, interestingly, my first introduction to the gospel came uh, as a result of a track in mud, or in the mud, at the group of the state fair as a kid. And it was, the Lord have mercy on me as a center of prayer and some words about why we should pray. Um, I, was, I was the first person in my family to get saved. Then my sister followed less than a few years later. Then my mom and dad were in a couple years after that. So it was somewhat like Christian story. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. I hear, you know, somebody in the, in, the, in the family gets converted and then has, the Lord uses that to affect others in the family. Uh, now in the, in the story that's before us with Christiana, and the boys, I mean, it's, excuse me, uh, we get, you know, all the way to Christian dies and, and goes to heaven. Uh, and then uh, on reflection of that and, and missing her husband and, and uh, the Lord working, obviously working in her heart uh, through dreams and, and what she's thinking, um, you know, she comes to know that, that uh, she needs her savior and um, starts out on pilgrimage um, and uh, the, the boys along with her. And uh, it's a beautiful story. And so um, that kind of testimony, it's important. I mean, and here, here Heidi just gave us an example in, in a couple of short sentences of what I would call the elevator testimony of being able to say, hey, this is what happened. You know, I found a track in the mud at the state fair and boom. Uh, the Lord used that uh, to bring me to uh, saving faith. That's a, a wonderful thing. All right, let's hit our last question, number four. Christiana's decision to become a pilgrim did not come about quickly. Describe the process of heart change that she experienced, and how does this compare with your own story and the stories of others that you know? Let me... Uh, As we talk about Christiana and her conversion, and it didn't happen quickly, you know, we start off the story in Pilgrim's Progress Part 1, and uh, her heart is the heart of stone. You know, it's the, it's the unfeeling, unsensitive, uh, unresponsive heart of stone. And um, this is the, the heart that we, we learn about in, in Ezekiel. Uh, that heart of stone needs to be removed and replaced by a heart of flesh. And that, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And he slowly works on her. And that's, you know, rarely do we have someone who... Um, is a profligate sinner who, you know, falls down and, and, you know, in the process gets up and, and becomes a Christian um, and is just converted like that. Uh, that is a rare occasion. Oftentimes it takes, you know, weeks and months and of wrestling. And, and I think this is one of the, one of the great things of this whole story is to see the wrestlings with the truths of God's word, to see the wrestlings with the truth of our condition before the Lord and our need uh, for a savior. And, um, and so this is, not a, this is not a quick process. So, you know, Bunyan doesn't give us uh, timeframes, uh, but he does give us 
you know, the sense of there's a wrestling. This do doesn't happen just overnight. Um, it's something that takes a while. Uh, but in Christiana's case, we see that indeed she does become, she's that heart of flesh or heart of stone is taken away and she's given a heart of flesh. And um, I like to depict it uh, with red and green. Uh, we got Christmas going on here. We got uh, red and green because not only is it's a, it's a living heart and green um, symbolizes that life uh, as well as the red, the red for the blood. Um, and, and so we have life and that abundantly in our new heart in Christ uh, that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we see that here depicted in her life as she uh, comes to a conviction that, you know, my husband had it right and I am, I'm going to follow. Uh, and praise the Lord, she and the boys, the boys respond uh, immediately with, with the same conviction, uh, with wholeheartedly. And it's a beautiful thing to see how uh, the conversion of these children is depicted, um, because they're counted as believers um, and welcome at the gate, you know, suffer the little children, you know, come unto me, um, do not hinder them. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. All right. So um, we have one, one last thing and then we'll be done. Yeah, one last uh, simple question. Uh, just in reference to what part should we read for next week's lesson? Good question. Uh, we're going to go through the read all about the interpreter's house. Okay. So read through the interpreter's house. I'll update um, if there's need to go beyond that. Uh, if you want to continue reading, you know, feel free to do so. Um, we're going to take everything from, you know, the, the road to the interpreter's house and, and the interpreter's house. And um, I think uh, after that, we go to Palace Beautiful. Um, so if you want to read on, keep reading, but uh, we won't go, we won't get to Palace Beautiful next week. We'll just be at the interpreter's house. Uh, so that's a great question, and I'll try to remember next week to have that in place for you, how far you need to read. Um, part of the problem with Pilgrim's Progress um, is it's not laid out in clean chapters. Um, that's one of the things I like about that spiral bound version that uh, John Musselman did, because it was cut into 25 weeks, 25 chapters, it was easy. Um, but the, you know, Bunyan's text is not, is not broken down that way. So great question. Read through the interpreter's house for next week, and um, we're past time. So let me pray for us. Father in heaven, thank you for this study of Pilgrim's Progress, part two. We're excited about it. Uh, it's fresh ground for most of us. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, open our hearts and minds to your word and how it's being depicted here and how it's being applied and uh, teach us through it by your grace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming this week. God bless y'all.